Thank you very much. Uh, I have enormous respect for Ofer's work, and it's a great honor to speak here. Also, what I will be talking about at the... So basically, I want to kind of give an overview about what we know and don't know about the irreducible representations of reductive algebraic groups in characteristic P, so as algebraic representations. <laughs> and uh, if I haven't completely poorly planned this talk, then at the end I should get to a connection with the decomposition theorem, which is probably the one theorem that I've thought about the most. And this, of course, Ofer had a lot to do with. Uh, so the setting is the following. We take G should be a um, reductive algebraic group over um, an algebraically closed field K and the characteristic of K is P and I'll assume from the outset that it's positive. So we're looking at rep G which is uh, the category of algebraic representations of G. So if you want, these are those representations of this abstract group in which the matrix coefficients are, are regular functions on G. And so we, given lambda a dominant weight, we can associate to this um, simple highest weight module So this is a socle of an induced module, uh, and all so all all irreducible representations are of this form. So this, I guess, is the theorem of Chevalier, and uh, and then the question that we want to study is the character of this L lambda. So just to give you some idea of what is known about this. So if G is SL2, then this acts on Nabla M, which is um, polynomials in two variables of degree M. And in this case, L of M is the socle of Nabla of M. And L of 0, L of 1, L up to P minus 1 are simple. So this you can do as an, it's not a difficult exercise. <laughs> Sorry. These are all simple and any, N, any LM is um, LM0 tensor. LM1 for Venus tensor ML. L for Venus. It's actually a general theorem in this context, though. Yes, so I'm just trying to give this as an example of a general theorem. So we have these, um, these building blocks, finitely many building blocks, where finite depends on P, and we can write, so this is um, for Venus twist. So pulling back this representation. So this kind of SL2 you can do as an exercise. <laughs> and then... Sorry? Ah, so, sorry, this is periodic expansion of M. So M is some MI. P to the I, zero is less than MI. <laughs> And so, uh, and then for um, SL3, so um, George Lissig explained to me that this was solved by uh, Braden in 1967. And then uh, SL4, uh, SP4, G2, 
These were handled by um, Janssen via the sum formula in the 1970s. So roughly speaking, what Janssen does is he puts a filtration on these um, nablers and has some formula that gives you some incomplete information about this filtration, but this formula is strong enough to handle these cases. And then um, SL5, SP6, spin 7, here there's a handful of handful of missing cases, but not, not very many. So somehow with, uh, with algebraic methods, you get somewhere to this range and then beyond that you need something new. And what is, uh, so I just want to give this kind of standard picture, this alcove picture. So we consider, uh, so here's our space of dominant weights. And then, then inside this we have some arrangement of hyperplanes. So this affine arrangement. So here's minus rho. So people have explained to me that you're an expert in the field if you can draw this picture correctly. So I will try. Okay, and so here we have um, this area here is the dominant weights. So, and then for every for each of these alcos, we make a choice. So we assume that p is bigger than equal to h, the Coxeter number. So that so says that our weight. Zero here is not on any hyperplanes. And then we just make a, an arbitrary choice inside every, every alcove of a weight. So, so these are the A is the alcoves. So the connected components of the complement of this hyperplane arrangement. I should say this is precisely, these walls are precisely the case where the vial character formula, the vial dimension formula is divisible by P. So it's somehow quite a natural picture to draw. So we consider these alcoves and then for any alcove a, I choose a weight inside that, so if I have an alcove of A, I choose a weight lambda of A, such that whenever two alcoves are related by a reflection, the corresponding weights are related by a reflection. So the, there is something with adding rho here, that if you have some affine vial group and other fundamental... Yeah, exactly. So this is the... It's kind of for lambda plus two because the zero is not... Exactly, yeah. And the interior, so it's some okay. So I take the affine arrangement, I dilate it by p, and I shift it back by minus rho. So that, yeah, and so there's the distance between these hyperplanes is p. Okay. But so then, then the chi plus the dominant. Uh, yeah. So I mean. The dominant. This is chi plus minus rho. No. So yeah, I should if I. Ah. Ah. Thank you. Yeah, so this picture is slightly inaccurate, namely one off this wall. Is the dominant, dominant way. So concerning this, I believe that there is a, a general fact called the vintage principle that tells you that uh, whatever you do, you only have to look at the orbits under the... Exactly. The, the only interesting question like how the Velma model, the composers, and things like that, are not very extensive. They're only, only the orbits under. Exactly, yeah. So basically, any, any, so the linkage principle and the translation principle tells us that if we want to answer questions in the representation theory of G, it's enough to answer it for one of these orbits, and I'm making some <laughs> random <laughs> choice of these orbits. Yep. So for example, if we want to understand so how some indecomposable module that's corresponding to this weight decomposes, then the only possibilities in its composition series are, are weights in this orbit. That's what I'm saying. Principle, are there also the generate cases where you translate to a wall? Yes. But somehow these are always simpler than, than the regular cases. So the regular case is the hardest. Okay. And there's precise 
ways in which you can say it's simpler when you go to war. And so now we have this, this Lustig character formula. From 1979, so I'll call this LCF, which is the statement that the, so I'll say the class in the growth and group, you could also say the character. So I want to rename, so um, LA is by definition the simple, the simple module with this highest weight. Um, yeah, so now I'm indexing everything via alcoves instead of via, uh, by highest weight, and it's the statement that this is the sum, and there's a sign that I won't go into, um, M, B, A, L to B. And so this is a, um, this is a so-called vial module with character given by our character formula. This is what we would like to understand if we're interested in this question. And then this is the this is a um, so-called spherical casualty polynomial. So this is some polynomial that's defined entirely um, in a combinatorial way starting from this picture uh, and we take its value at one and this is the conjectured expression and there's some, uh, so the first thing that one should say is we, um, so assume, so if alpha check um, a plus rho is less than so this is a Janssen condition. So we only expect this character formula to hold for simple modules that aren't too, far, too high out. But um, if P is bigger than, yeah, so basically this is enough to, to know this formula. And so in this example of SL2, you see that there's these P minus one building blocks from which you can get all representations. This is the case here also in general, <coughs> by Steinberg tensor product theorem. And so if we know this formula, then we're okay. So MBA is evaluated at one? Yes, the value of a casual polynomial at one. Alpha, any, 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 any uh, positive root. Sorry, so you just, so the generalization of this kind of decomposition with Friedenius twists? Yes. You said that like comes from the delta somehow? So there's a region here which is the restricted weights, which I'll actually need in a second. So you're summing up the which bees? Hang on a second, one question at a time, please. <laughs> so this is the um, restricted weights. So these are those. So that if I write these in the fundamental weights, all of my digits should be less than p minus 1. And it turns out that I can, so for any highest weight, I can do a periodic expansion, periodic expansion in terms of the restricted weights. And then if I form the corresponding tensor product, that will be simple. That's Steinberg's theorem. So it's enough to know um, the characters of these guys. And then it turns out that for P not too small, this region actually lies inside this Janssen condition. And so then I'm okay. Yeah, so what's the other question? You're summing up the which piece in this formula? I'm yeah, so these these will just be non-zero for finitely many b. So finitely many b, which are in some sense less than a, than the order. Exactly. <coughs> so after all b, because we give zero zero. Yeah. Okay. 
plus or minus, what do you get plus and how do you get minus? Uh, it's just, it's the num I mean, it's the number of hyperplanes separating B and A. It's like minus one to the power bit. Uh, but somehow this is, so for the, for the corresponding quantum group, this is a perfect conjecture. There's, there's none of this Janssen con condition and it holds always. But this is somewhat uh, problematic for algebraic groups. I mean, even in its formulation, it's somewhat difficult to get your head around. And there's a different version, which is called uh, Lustig periodic formula, which is better, which I'll explain now. Will I ever be able to get that backboard back down? So a basic fact is that if lambda is restricted, so the restricted weights in this example of SL2 are precisely this 0 up to p minus 1, then this L of lambda is simple as a g equals Li g module. Okay, and somehow the Li algebra is much simpler than Looking at modules for the Lie algebra is somehow much simpler than looking at modules for the algebraic group. And so um, it's natural to consider G modules with compatible T action. So T, T inside G is a maximal torus. Uh, so, so that the meaning of this should be should be clear. So I consider a module with a T action such that when I differentiate the T action, I get the same as the T inside here, and these are called. Um, That's the compatibility, like for GK modules. The exactly. G action, G, and so you have the two conditions. It's like GK modules for. It's like yeah, G. So the algebra modules of characteristic P. Yes. Yeah. And so there's a real, I mean, if, if you're used to talking about characteristic, thinking about characteristic zero, which I guess is less normal in this audience, then, uh, <laughs> uh, then yeah, you should be aware that there's a big difference between, of course, yeah, but I don't need to tell you this, uh, between the G, big G modules and little g modules, between algebraic group modules and the algebra modules. And characteristic zero yeah. is, the, is the same. Is Basically, yeah, essentially the same. Yeah. But here, there's a big difference. But for simple modules, it's OK. There's um, essentially no difference. And then, uh, so this is the world of G1T modules. And so here we can, so this is a, I'll write hat for G1T modules. So this is a simple highest weight module. And so in the world of representations of G, it's not, <coughs> So, for example, in the represent representation theory of G, there's the projective modules are kind of pro-objects, and so they're very large, and you don't usually work with them. Whereas in the world of G1T modules, you have these nice finite-dimensional projective covers. So this is projective cover. As a G1T module, <laughs> and then the um, Lustig periodic formula. And this is explicit, this is known character. Uh, this guy? Yeah. No. no. So knowing this, the character of this, is basically the same question as knowing the character of this. Oh, okay. So very, yeah, so, the, um, so then we have the Lustig periodic formula. Is it something like the reciprocity, like the in general module, the P over? Exactly. Okay. That's exactly what it is, yeah. Perfect. Um, is this Lustig periodic formula, which tells us that the class of P of A hat is the B A at one. 
delta v hat. So before this was a, in the original formulation, this is a vial module, so it's got, got um, character given by a vial character formula. This, is, this guy is called something called a baby verma module. And so this guy, um, up to shifts in the weight lattice, always has the same character. It's finite dimensional. So um, delta v hat is, is the restricted Lee algebra of G. Restricted Lee algebra of V. So this is a, a finite dimensional kind of standard module. And uh, this is um, uh, periodic. Periodic Cajun point nebula. Again, evaluated at one. And so the beauty of the theory, so in some sense, why do we work with G1T modules rather than G modules? The reason is that modules for G, uh, the, the grading by weight spaces is, is by um, something like the character lattice tensored with Z mod PZ. And so it's kind of, uh, and that's, very annoying and so you kind of unwrap this grading so that it becomes a genuine T grading but now you can tensor by P times an element of the character lattice and so the representation theory is periodic so the representation of G and T modules is periodic and um, and this is the corresponding theory of Cajunistic polynomials for a periodic situation so is this a finite or infinite sum? this is also a finite sum so I'll give you some examples. Uh, and one should keep in mind Ofer's remark from before that knowing this, so this fault remark is that this Lustig periodic formula implies um, a character formula. Those were originally conjectures. Yeah, so, yes. So I'm just stating, so I'm stating them as formulas at the moment that may or not, may not hold and I'll discuss their validity in a second. Yeah, because you already gave previous talks about the torsion and... Yes. Okay, so I know that... Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, so just some examples. So for SL2, here the picture looks like this. And then the um, periodic pattern just always like I'm just giving you the value at one of these periodic polynomials. And so this is just, this is telling you that no matter where you are, your projective has two baby Verma module multiplicities in there, like this. And so in SL3, there's two cases. So let's see, for SL2, when you are <coughs> low enough so that the representation is irreducible, yes. uh, what is the P and the baby and how they are, how, what do you, I didn't understand the, the, the drawing part, so you have. So, so this will be some alcove. Well, let's say, the, okay, some alcove. Yep, and let's say that zero is inside here. Okay, so okay, you take the basic. By the way, this is just for the basic for any ah, this is for any alcohol. But yes. Okay, but, that but it's all it's all periodic. It's completely periodic the situation. And then there is only one alcohol uh, left when you in SL two. So here the projective. Okay. So this would be two p minus two. Okay. And then the um, projective would be. Would look like this. And, and, uh, and the relation of uh, and the, the relation of delta to L is the same as the relation <coughs> to delta. Yes. Okay. So essentially, in order to get right the deltas in terms of the L's, you transpose this matrix, yes. and then in, to write the L's in terms of the deltas, you take its inverse. So in principle, it's, it, it, I mean, it's a, this looks li like the cleanest answer. It's, it gets very messy when you do this in practice, but I mean, you know, you can do it. 
So now you see that I'm not an expert. Okay, and so this is this is representing the structure of certain projective G1 T modules, and this is can, you can calculate these pictures in some um, simple algorithmic way, but they're not usually. The, this is somehow deceptive because they look reasonably simple. Um, so you don't need to go very far before these pictures become very, very complicated. Okay, so in the translation, there are several, under the translation that you said, there are several equivalent, uh, several, uh, so how many classes modular translation you have in the case of SL3? Two. Yeah, it's always, um, it's always what we call, what do you call it, P mod R, the index of connection. No, sorry, 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 that's wrong. So that's the number of cases you have to do is file group modulo index of connection. So it's n minus one factorial for SLN. Okay, so now we'll talk about the validity of these um, these statements. So, uh, so one remark is that these two are equivalent. And then the status. So one thing that uh, should th somehow motivating this is some old conjectures of, basically it was Verma that I think first said that this kind of alcove picture should be behind the representation theory and that it starts looking independent of P in some sense. So we, we fix a root system. <coughs> and then we can consider um, primes. And the combinatorics is much more complicated below the Coxeter number. So here's the Coxeter number. So, e.g. n for SLN. So this is what we call small primes. And for many, since the, for a long time, we've known that there's behavior here that's somewhat mysterious. And th what the hope was, was that these um, formulas would hold for some reasonable bound on H. So for example, maybe for all primes larger than H or for all primes larger than 2H or something like that. <laughs> and then in the 90s, so there's too many names for me to, so I'll just write initials. So this is um, Kajna Lustig, Kashiwara Tanisaki Lustig. Anderson, Janssen, Zergel, uh, proved that there is a, there is an, there is a, is a, um, there is an N, non-effective, such that this holds for all p bigger than n. Uh, but this n was not known in any case. So even, for example, SL5, there's something like one number that Janssen would like to know. And so there's no way you can even check on computer whether this one number is one or two or something. And then uh, in 2008, um, Phoebe gave an explicit enormous bound 
So e.g., um, it's LCF is true for p bigger than n to the n squared. Okay. So, for example, yeah. 10 to the 100 for SL10. Okay. So, a very large number. And then, um, so based on work with a number of different people, so Elias. Ah, uh, for SLN, sorry. So based on work with Elias Shukahu, um and also some uh, uh, some number theory with um, Kontorovich and McNamara. Um, there exists, so LCF does not hold um, for many P, um, but so for many P up to an exponential in N for SLN. So basically uh, what, we, what we do is construct examples up to some P of the order of C to the N for some C, for some C bigger than one. Um, and so somehow there's this place here that's, that's exponentially far off, well at least exponentially far off where LCF is valid. But there's this whole world here of, um, of medium primes. Medium primes where LCF doesn't necessarily hold. <coughs> What do you mean by for many p? So, basically, yeah, I, I think that we show that it's basically for all p up in up to up to some some exponential bound, yeah. Or, yeah. And how C and N So C is just so C is some number bigger than one, and of N? Independent of N. Okay. So an example is that um, if, so just an example of this phenomenon is that if um, P divides the nth Fibonacci number, then um, LCF fails for some L A um, for S L um, something like four n plus five in characteristic P. Okay, so it seems extremely interesting that there's certain. So this is a very arithmetic question, and that this is somehow happening in the representation theory of SLN is maybe surprising. Well, at least for me. Okay, so... I was thinking, what on earth can this be for? But then I realized. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry?
when do I finish quarter two, no? Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so the theorem that I want to uh, state today, <laughs> so the theorem, so this is, um, so this is a recent uh, work with Simon Rich from Clément Ferrand, but um, it's based on a, a long project with um, Atcha. Somehow where all the work is done is in this, this long project with Atcha, Makasumi and Rich. Um, so the statement is that basically this formula holds, so for all p bigger than 2h minus 2, I'll comment on this in a second, um, This formula holds, so it bears a very, it looks almost the same. Right, these are um, so called P, these are periodic P casualties polyhedrals. So I'll explain in more detail what these are in a second, but roughly speaking, Kajanutsik polynomials are measuring the stalks of intersection cohomology complexes on the flag radian. These are measuring the stalks of some, some objects called parity sheaves on the... And so the remarks are... So firstly, there's essentially finitely many of these polynomials. So for fixed... root system, these P, D, B, A, R, D, B, A, for all P bigger than some non-explicit bound. So it's something like, if you have a, imagine you have finitely many algebraic varieties, then their integral intersection cohomology will have no torsion above some bound, but you won't necessarily be able to say what that bound is. But if it's not too big, bound could be enough. Why don't it so? Yeah, so I mean, we can't re-derive Phoebe's bound. What? We can't re-derive Phoebe's bound from this. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. So this is worse than, okay. so this implies LCF for large P. Yeah, there's, there's now about three different proofs of loosely character formula for large P, but this gives another one. Um, there's no sign, no. no. In the previous one, there was. Yes. Yeah. So signs are whenever you're expressing simples in terms of something, and no signs are whenever you're expressing projectives in terms of something. Um, so we conjecture. The formula to hold for all p. So it should be completely uniform. Um, and it seems to check out in, in small examples that we can calculate. But there was a problem with, you said for sufficiently small p, the zero yes. is not in the right place in the diagram, so... But there's some simple modification that seems to work, so with appropriate... Okay, we'll with small modification. For so all p you mean without this restriction that p is... Exactly, yeah. So this is, that's a theorem and then we conjecture that actually you can just cross this out with appropriate modifications for the fact that there won't be regular weights for p bit smaller than the Coxeter number. And so just to give you um, some feel, so these p dba are much harder to calculate. And DBA, so, so you can ask, is this any, um, you know, does it improve the situation at all? Have we just given something, are we just expressing something uncomputable in terms of something else uncomputable? I mean, not uncomputable in a formal sense. All these things are computable in a formal sense, but just very difficult. Um, but this should, so experiments suggest 
the usual characteristic uh, formulas have polynomials are given by some uh, inductive procedures. You can calculate it and then we are given a test. Yes. And th these things, the uh, so parity shifts which are related to algebraic geometry, so is it still given by some... Uh, it's given, it's not... It's not entirely. It's not given entirely in terms of the combinatorics of Coxeter group combinatorics. So you need to know something about the root system, but it is computable in the sense that I can type it into my computer and press enter, and it gives me an answer. In um, so I can compute these these polynomials in many cases, but I can compute them no way nowhere near as efficient, efficiently as Cauchy polynomials, and it's unlikely that we ever can compute them as. Is this an answer? There is not, no, the question is whether there is a formula like that for the kajdan lustig polynomial or it involves some thing defined using algebraic geometry. So there's a formula that involves only linear algebra and combinatorics of okay. Coxeter groups. Yeah. It doesn't involve some calculation in algebraic geometry that I may or may not be able to do. Yeah. Expre a quantum analog if you start in mind? A quantum analog? Yeah, so somehow the quantum group just, universally you just ignore the P and it seems to be fine. I mean, that's also theorems. Again, with one or with Q? No, with one. O always with one. Yes. Um, the experiment suggests formula. Should provide a complete answer. in ranks less than or equal to six. So, you know, before we knew, s b at the moment we know A1, A2, A3, B2 and G2. And the kind of, you know, it's more effective in the sense that we can go from these cases up to rank six, but probably not beyond that. I mean, computer, so, I mean, I should, I should say, experiments suggest we should be able to com do the calculation of these polynomials in ranks less than or equal to six. Ah, okay, this is the, so you don't regard it? No, at, at the end of the day, I actually want to know what the character is, um, and that's, yeah, that's what I'm asking about. Is it not clear? So, we should, um, that all these experiments suggest that um, that the PD BA should be computable. in ranks less than or equal to six. So, I, I mean, another example is, imagine that I ask you for simple highest weight modules over Lie algebra for um, SL400 or something. We have a formula in terms of Kajanusic polynomials, but we can never carry out this calculation. You know, this, the, the calculation is just too large. And so, there was this Atlas project that carried this out for E8. And this was some enormous calculation. And, and what I'm saying is that we should be able to carry out this calculation in ranks less than or equal to six. But that's still not done. So I want to explain what these p polynomials are, at least roughly. So, um, um, 
So if we have f from x tilde to x, a projective morphism, complex varieties, then a special case of, of the decomposition theorem is that um, f lower star, so this is r f lower star, of the constant sheaf on x tilde is is a semi-simple complex in the sense of diverse sheaves. Okay. So it splits as a direct sum of its perverse cohomology groups, and each of these perverse cohomology groups is a semi-simple perverse sheaf. And the um, fact. So a remark is that the fact that we use Q coefficients is essential. So of course x tilde is non singular. Ah, I'm sorry, of course. Yes, so this is smooth. X can have singular. Yes. So just a, a simple example which I love is if we take x to be some quadratic cone inside A3, and then we have x tilde, the blow up in 0 of x. Then f lower star, so this is isomorphic to the total space of O of minus 2 on P1. And the kind of absolutely essential point in this example is that this zero section here, which is contracted by this map, has self-intersection minus 2. So f lower star of the constant sheaf on x tilde is... Um, semi-simple. So in this case, it's always a perverse sheaf because this is a semi-small map. But it's semi-simple if and only if the characteristic of k is not equal to 2. So in characteristic 2, you get some interesting indecomposable... So th I, I'm always talking about the, the coefficients of the... the characteristic of the coefficients. So So that, as I said before, the key point is that the if f is the the zero section, then the self intersection of f <coughs> is minus two. So in general, for any p dividing this, you'll have problems. And so now we apply this to the flag variety. So let x be the complex. So now I change and consider complex flag variety. And we consider xx to be a Schubert variety. x a Schubert variety. And then what are ordinary Cajunistic polynomials? So the so this 
is the, defined to be the intersection cohomology of this guy with Q coefficients. So the stalks are given by casual and sick polynomials. So now, for any reduced expression, we can consider, uh, so x for x in the vial group, we can consider this um, plot samuelson resolution. And this has a natural multiplication map to G mod B. So yeah, so at some point I stopped writing sub subscript Cs, but I hope it's clear. Um, so this is a bot samuelson resolution. What is small x? So this is just any element of the Vial group. Okay. This is bot samuelson resolution. Which is some very useful kind of combinatorial resolutions of, sorry, this should go to the Schubert variety inside here. And then um, the decomposition theorem says that IC of XQ appears as, as a sum and inside um, the direct image Q of this uh, and this leads to a so if you imagine what's happening here you you have the decomposition theorem tells you that um, you have this intersection cohomology complex supported on the open orbit and then you have stuff supported on smaller orbits but there you know all the stalks by induction and so this gives a combinatorial expression for casual and polynomials. M star means derived. Derived, yeah. I think from the, yeah. Always derived. Uh, and there's another kind of way of looking at this, which is just consider this whole world of, of kind of Schubert varieties and their partial resolutions, and imagine that you're allowed to start with constant sheaves on, constant sheaves on their shifts on things that are smooth, and then you're just allowed to push forward and take some ends then all you'll ever get is intersection cohomology complexes, which is kind of remarkable. And so now you can ask the same question in, with coefficients of characteristic p. So you know, if you don't want to mention perverse sheaves, you can, you can still characterize this object as, well, you could still attempt to give a definition of it as being the unique sum and inside this that's indecomposable and has support on the open locus. So by the way, because I looked at the kind of polynomials is in the 79, that is Slightly before the, the decomposition theorem. So what was the, or, the original intuition for? So I can use this question to advertise some wonderful notes on George's website where he gives some notes to his papers. Yeah. And there's a very, very nice explanation of various things that led to Kajansik polynomials. Okay, three minutes, very good. Five minutes, ah, okay. Uh, and then a, a kind of somewhat surprising fact which was first noticed by Zogel in certain cases and then generalized by um, Jouton, Mautner and myself, is that um, 
there exists. So, um, so the sum and inside such a direct image um, in any characteristic is well defined up to isomorphism. The indecomposable sum and is well defined. So this means that if I take two different resolutions, then this, this direct image sheaf will be very different in principle. But if I just look at the unique indecomposable sum and that has open support on the Schubert variety, then this will give me a well-defined object up to isomorphism. So in general, <laughs> both, both semi-simplicity aspects fail. That is, it is not the direct sum of the perverse sheaf. Exactly. And, it, and each of those is not semi-simple. Yeah. And, and so here you are just using the Kohl Schmidt, I mean, to know that there is some de the composition to in the composer, which is the final phase of Exactly. This is what you are, okay. Yeah. So that's, yeah, so it's, I'm very heavily using the Kohl Schmidt theorem here in, in this derived category of constructible sheaves. It's well defined up to us. And this is an example of what we call a parity sheaf. So this depends on the field K. And then uh, we have EX. K is isomorphic to EX. Q um, in large characteristic. Sorry. <laughs> oh, is isomorphic to the ah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, what, what I want to say is that <laughs> I see X. LK if P is for P large depending on X. So once we fix X, there is a P above which there's no torsion in the stalks of or co-stalks of this thing. And once we reduce that mod P, we get this parity sheaf. But this example up here is is kind of illustrative of what happens in general. So there'll be some small primes for which this agreement does not occur. And then we get this new and genuinely, like, a very interesting object. And I'll just say as a remark that, um, that I find this an, a very interesting question. So moreover, you can show that if you consider all kind of partial resolutions of Schubert varieties um, th of bots hamilton type, and you allow smooth things on, so you allow constant sheaves on smooth things, and then you allow yourself to push forward and take some ends, then you only get a finite list of objects that are parameterized in the same way as IC sheaves. And I've often thought about what could happen in general, but I seem to get stuck with curves. Um, in general, you mean for? I, I mean, is there some class of maps and some, some class of proper maps that I can fix? Another case where this is true is, for example, all toric maps between toric varieties. Um, but but so here, the, the, this is self-dual by construction. Yes. And the IC is not quite self-dual because of the torsion. Exactly. So yeah. this is, a, yeah, so there is a, okay, so this is closely related to the question of torsion in IC, but it's, a priori, it could be that although I see is not self dual it may be the reduction mod P could still be in the composable. Yeah, but it'll never, I guess in this, in this setting, it'll never be this guy if it's not self dual uh, Well, obviously, because... Uh, anyway, well, the self-duality yeah. is given by certain map. Okay, but then since, since uh, on the open stratum, you know it. Ah. Uh, Let me write one more sentence that finishes my talk and then... Um, so, P cash under six polynomials are um, defined to be the stalks of, are given by the stalks of these EXK. And there's a completely different way of understanding these, um, these guys via some diag diagrammatic algebra, which allows you to compute things with them. But I won't go into that, so thank you very much.
questions or comments? Just to, uh, to clarify about the indecomposable ones of the intermorphism ring of the indecomposable the higher dimensional algebra is not on trivial algebra terms, but this, uh, so my question is, of course you can have some phenomena when K not algebraically closed. So, uh, so the question is whether the uh, indecomposable are the same or it's a small K bar and whether the endomorphism ring is actually, let us say, it's just small K. Okay. In all cases, yeah. In those, in those cases. Yeah. Questions? Okay, so let's end here.